So good morning, everyone. Actually, it's not morning, it's afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the survey construction workshop for CPB Hyperloop. This is our third workshop at, uh, out of our series of 12 workshops we're hosting this semester. Uh, this is just a show of hands. How many of you guys have been to one of these workshops before? Or all of you, wow. <laughs> awesome. And um, for those of you at Dunbar, um, this will be your first in-person workshop, which is a lab. This is our first lab type workshop, which means you guys get kits and stuff to build with, which is super exciting. So um, the format of lab type workshops are going to be like this. We're going to have one hour of lecture on teaching you guys how to use the equipment, what the proper safety protocol is for being in a lab, and then um, some challenges you guys will do. And then for the, for next two, for the uh, next two hours from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., you guys will be in a lab setting, constructing circuits, and getting them to work. You guys will have access to power supplies, multimeters, automatic wire cutters, jumper wire, tape, more cutters, basically everything you need to make a circuit. So we have about three of these labs per semester. We have the soldering workshop that's going to be in a few weeks, as well as the Arduino workshop, which is at the very end of the semester. So um, those are things to look up for. But today we are going to be dealing with circuit construction. So let's get started. Um, so first, let's go over some of the equipment. Now for this section, I went ahead and provided the um, lecture material for this uh, equipment this morning, actually, so that I could demonstrate how to use them at my home lab and then show you guys here. So I'm going to have to remember how to do this for the Zoom because it's going to like echo, but I'm going to play a video. I'm going to mute the Zoom and then um, it's going to share the sound, I hope. So the first equipment we're going to go over is the pocket breadboard. So if you guys take a look at inside your kit, you'll see a little device that kind of looks like a breadboard holder. Oh, uh, guess what? It is a breadboard holder. Uh, you put your breadboard in it and it gives you access to the uh, terminal blocks or the binding posts. These binding posts um, are seen in larger breadboards, usually ones used in most of your labs. So if you're an ECE major, um, you will take 1101 lab or 2200 lab or 3301 lab. Each of these labs requires the use of a very big breadboard. And so this is a smaller version of that. And it's really great for just any sort of lab work you might need. And these breadboards are replaceable, so you can go ahead and put a new one if you want to test a new circuit. So let's go ahead and see what this is for. The pocket breadboard is a device designed to be used in a laboratory setting to build and test circuits that are not too large in size. The pocket breadboard comes with five terminal block binding posts, which are compatible with banana and alligator clips and can be connected to DC power supplies, oscilloscopes, and probes. The pocket breadboard is compatible with a singular 400 pin breadboard, which you can just clip into the middle here. Looking on the back of the pocket breadboard, we can see the connections for the binding post to the, to the actual 3D printed case for the breadboard to be a singular nut. Now this nut can sometimes come loose. To remove the nut, twist the nut in the opposite direction, leftwards, and it will be loosened. Over time, use of the pocket breadboard can periodically loosen this nut, allowing for a loose top and inability to untwist it and use its features. To fix this, insert the binding post back into the hole of the pocket breadboard and screw on the nut in the clockwise direction to tighten it. Line the hole of the metal component on top with the hole in the pocket breadboard and screw inwards. Use a set of pliers to grip the nut and wrench it to the right. This will ensure that your binding post will be nice and taut and back in place. as you can see here. In order to connect wires to your pocket breadboard, you will need one of these alligator or banana clips. The banana clips can be plugged directly into the binding post here to provide power and ground to your circuit. Similarly, the alligator clips can also reach into the metal components of the binding post and provide a signal to your circuit as well. Alternatively, you can unscrew the binding post 
and insert a wire into the bottom of it. And then screw it in and lock it in place. I will be using this 22 gauge jumper wire to demonstrate this action. By using an automatic wire stripper, you can adjust the amount of wire stripped to be more than enough. Cutting a long piece of bare wire will allow you to insert the entire wire into the binding post. Wrapping it around the edges, such as this, will ensure a tight connection between the binding post and the wire. Now you can adjust the automatic wire stripper back in place and make a single nice connection between the jumper wire and your breadboard. Now, if you turn on your power source and you supply five volts or whatever voltage you would like to provide your circuit and you insert the banana plugs into power and ground, you can provide your circuit with 5 volts or whatever else power you have from your benchtop power supply directly into your breadboard. And if you would like this to be portable and disconnected from the lab supplies, all you need to do is just disconnect the banana plugs or alligator clips and take your circuit with you. The next time you would like to test your circuit, all you need, all you need to do again is plug the banana plugs back into the binding posts and you're good to go. This has been a demonstration of the pocket breadboard, and I hope you enjoy using it. Are there any questions as to how this thing is used as of right now? You might have questions later. Yes? So I think one of the need a wire stripper to get the wire out. We don't have a wire stripper, but we could use the Yes, that is possible. You can use DuPont jumper wires. Those are what those are called. Um, we will provide uh, automatic wire strippers and 22 gauge jumper wires in the lab for you. So you'll have access to wire you can use to um, build a circuit. In fact, uh, this is a pretty important topic. I'll cover on that later on about wiring. Any other questions? Nope, pretty self explanatory. Awesome. The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is the component gauge, the little square of PLA. What is it for? Now, um, it may just look like it's a nice little decorative piece, but it actually has some functions. So let's see what it is. Hi. In this video, I'll be demonstrating why you need a component gauge to make your circuit in a year. This is a component gauge, a specially designed 3D printed little tool to help make your circuit a lot neater. When you're building your circuit, let's say you're using resistors, normally what you would do is bend your resistor into this kind of shape and then insert it into your breadboard. Now doing this is completely fine, but these long leads may run you into some trouble later on. When you have multiple resistors together, and let's say you are carrying your uh, circuit from one place to another, these resistor leads might bump into each other and touch while you're testing. And these resistor wires are metal, therefore if they touch together, they'll form a short circuit. Sometimes that is really detrimental to your uh, testing and you don't want that to happen. So the solution to this is just to make your circuit neater by cutting the resistor leads so that it is flush with the breadboard. Now you can do this by hand and it is possible to do so and you usually do gain sort of a muscle memory of like how deep the breadboard is, where you should cut it in order to get the exact measurements, but that takes practice. And you can do this exactly uh, right by using a component gauge. So stick the resistor, and this is a half watt resistor, into the holes on the top of the component gauge. And all you need to do is take a pair of wire cutters, such as this one, and snip off the leads. Now the thickness of this component gauge is about six millimeters, which is exactly the depth of a breadboard. And so when you take your resistor out, the resistor will now have short LEDs, and these LEDs can fit exactly into the breadboard. 
Now your resistor is flush with the rest of the breadboard and will not cause you any issues in terms of short circuiting or actually just general troubleshooting when you are making a large circuit. So I can demonstrate this one more time to show that the circuit is now neat. I'll take my component, I will stick it in the top hole, and this hole works for uh, half watt resistors. I will take my wire strippers, my wire, wire cutters, and I will cut off the resistor lead flush with the bottom of the component gauge. Just like this. Now when I take my resistor out, it'll have the exact right length of leads in order to stick directly into the breadboard and have it flush with the breadboard itself. Therefore, now our resistors are very neat into the breadboard and now we can take a look at them um, and we know that very clearly they are resistors and they're in this position of the breadboard and when I'm troubleshooting my circuit, I wouldn't have to be confused about uh, whether which resistor is what in terms of connecting everything else to my circuit in the future. Now the component gauge doesn't just work with resistors, it can also work with LEDs, transistors, diodes, and whatnot. The holes are designed for use with a quarter watt resistor and a half watt resistor, which are usually larger. However, if you have any other component, you can insert them into the sides. So for example, I have an LED here, and I'm going to put the LED into the side panels, which have holes along the complete edge of it. And since this design is used for a six millimeter um, offset, this will work incompatible um, with it as well. So all I need to do is go ahead and cut the bottom of the components, in which I'm going to do so right now. And for an LED, I usually want to keep the longer leg longer. So I will cut the shorter leg a sli slightly shorter than the longer leg. In this case, I will have something that looks like this. Now this LED can then be inserted into the breadboard in any location, and it will be flush with the surface of the breadboard. So say goodbye to messy circuits and messy wiring with using the component gauge. And thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy using it. All right, so that has been the component gauge. Are there any questions? Hi. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just a brief word about the component gauge before we move on from it. All of you guys have quarter watt resistors inside your um, kits. So you guys will be most likely using the bottom hole. And then if you have, want to cut LEDs or diodes or anything else like that, you can just use the side holes for it. All right. Hi. And this let's, let's talk about the benchtop power supply now. So um, in Dunbar, I don't know if you guys have access to this. I think you guys should. But this is an essential piece of lab equipment, and it requires um, more technique to use than the other two um, pieces of equipment shown so far. Let's take a look at the benchtop power supply. In this video, I'll be going over how to use the benchtop power supply, one of the most crucial tools for any aspiring engineer. So the benchtop power supply provides our circuit with power, uh, both voltage and current, and allows it to run successfully. To use the benchtop power supply, the first safety measure you must do at every single point of the test is to turn these knobs all the way down. This is due to um, the user error of not doing this before completing the last test. You don't want, when you're turning on your benchtop power supply, to get any like weird settings. Like um, if you're testing a 5 volt circuit, but you previously had 12 volts programmed into it and you already hooked it up, by plugging this into your circuit with 12 volts, you may blow the circuit up. So that's definitely not good. So once all the knobs are zeroed out, you can then turn on the benchtop power supply and you see all zeros. That means there's no voltage and no current currently being drawn um, from the circuit. In order to change the voltage, which is usually the common application for beginner circuits, what you want to do is you want to turn the A course, which is the current, all the way up to the maximum. This will switch the light from the current mode to voltage mode, and then you can change the voltage from anywhere from zero to 30 volts. That is the limit for this power supply. So let's say I want to test the circuit with five volts. I will go ahead and turn my voltage up to five. And I'm gonna get really close, but not really. So what I can do instead is this comes with another knob called V-fine and I can adjust the voltage 
um, like that. So it says I need to like do it a little bit lower. So I can then turn the V fine up and this will give you more control over the power source. So I can get all the way exactly up to five volts. There we go. Cool. Now I can use this and test my circuit with five volts. So I'm gonna go over how to use the current knob next. If we short these two power LEDs together, we can see that the power source goes up to 10 amps. That means 10 amps is currently traveling through these two LEDs. I'm not gonna do this for long because it actually destroys the power supply. But you can see how there's a 10 amp limit. It doesn't go above that, even though a short circuit should produce infinite current. That is because there is a 10 amp fuse inside this black box that prevents the current from going any higher than that. 10 amps is the maximum amount of current this can handle. In order to control this current, um, we can actually use this knob, the A course knob, and lower it to change the current draw maximum. For example, if you're testing a motor um, in a circuit and you're saying the physical circuit can only draw about 3 amps of current, um, it's not really realistic to use uh, one of these um, 10 amp current draws to test the motor because it'll be inaccurate. So what you want to do is you want to set a 3 amp threshold, a 3 amp ceiling for when you're testing your circuit. So I've, I've lowered the A course knob by a fair, fair amount. So if I go ahead and connect my two LEDs again, I can now see that the amperage is about 3.69 amps. So when I'm connecting five volts to a motor and it's gonna uh, pull some amount of current, it's only gonna go up to three amps. And of course I can keep changing it and limiting the amount of current. For example, if I go ahead and um, test my motor with a nine volt battery, the specifications of a 9 volt battery are that it, like, it can only provide 0.61 amps to any circuit. Um, so if I want to simulate a 9 volt battery on one of these power sources, all I would do is I would turn the A course down to about 0.61 amps. You can see some sparks happening if I try to um, grip it. And so I would go ahead and adjust this down to about... 0.61, something like that. And then when I plug this um, power supply into my circuit, I will be simulating what it's like for the circuit to be run using a 9 volt battery with a 0.61 amp ceiling. And that's how you use a power supply for beginners. So you can go ahead and after you do your test, turn all the knobs back to zero. So again, you don't like run into the error of having higher voltage than expected. And then just making sure that everything is zeroed out at the end of the test, and then you're done. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy using benchtop power supplies. Neat. Um, that was the benchtop power supply. Are there any questions? Cool. Now moving on. Next one is breadboards. So each kit that you have should have two breadboards inside of it. Um, and that's so you can do like double experiments. Usually in kits you only get one. Uh, but by having two breadboards, it allows you to have a circuit on each breadboard. So like the more breadboards you have, the more circuits you can test. In this video, I'll be providing a brief introduction as to how breadboards work. Breadboards, and this is a 400 pin breadboard, usually comes in three different components. In this case, mine comes with two power rails on each side of the breadboard and one main component where your circuit will be built. These side power rails are what provides power to your circuit. Circuits. You have a rail for power, which is the uh, VCC, which is the red, and a rail for ground. If we look on the back of a breadboard, and this is what a breadboard looks like if you uncover the back part of it, it's a little bit dusty, you can see that the power rails have all the vertical pins connected together. Which means, if you go ahead and put a wire into the top pin for the ground section, you'll get the same signal on the very, very bottom. Same for any other location on the vertical rail. This is because all the vertical rails are connected together via one strip of metal, which means they're all connected with each other. If we take our multimeter, switch it to um, the continuity test mode, we can see that the top portion of the breadboard for this rail is continuous with the bottom section. That little beep you hear when you hear the continuity test means that it is continuous. 
Same for the power rail and all the other side rails as well. So when you're building your circuit and providing power to your circuit, what you can do is you can provide power and ground at, as one component of these, at one pin of these side panels, and it will provide power for like the entire vertical area. Same for the right side. Now, the left and right side of the power are not connected together. Therefore, if you want to access the power both from both left and right rails, you'll have to put a wire connecting the left side and the right side together. Now, be very careful of short circuits because this is the part where um, a lot of mistakes can happen. The red always represents your VCC, your voltage common collector, your 5 volts or whatever voltage you're coming from. The blue side always represents ground. So if you follow these conventions and you don't connect anything backwards, you'll always stay safe in your circuit. But just keep that in mind because that is usually the best way to stay in check with whatever uh, voltage is coming out. When you're connect if you connect something with reverse polarity, which means you connect ground to the red line or 5 volts to the blue line, you'll get very confused later on as to why your circuit is smoking. So the best way to do that is just to make sure that your VCC is always on the red line and your ground is always on the blue line. That will eliminate a lot of errors initially. Now you'll notice that the main part of the circuit is connected a bit differently. All of the horizontal sections are actually connected together instead of the vertical sections. Therefore, if I had some sort of signal on this row of the breadboard, I would get the same signal on the same row but on a different pin. So everything in this row is connected together by a metal panel on the back. So for example, if I can take this continuity test of each of the rows, we can see it is connected together. That sound just means like you have a connection between those two points. You'll see that we have a little bridge in the middle where there is no metal connection. Therefore, if I put a signal on, let's say, row 12 on the leftmost pin, it will not travel to the very rightmost row of the 12th pin. Therefore, you have a lot of options when connecting circuits together on either side of the breadboard. So as a recap, for the power rails, all of the vertical pins are connected together. For the center part, all of the horizontal rows are connected together. And it is very obvious to see that when you're looking at the back of the breadboard. This has been a brief introduction of the breadboard and how it's used, and I hope you enjoy using it. Any questions on using breadboards? Just want to say, like every breadboard comes with like um, a sticky back part, so like your breadboard should have a yellow uh, sticker that you can peel back, and then you can like stick the breadboard to anything. Um, that means if you want to keep your pocket breadboard with a singular breadboard forever, you can like stick your breadboard onto the pocket breadboard and then um, carry it with you around places. Um, if you peel off that yellow sticker on the back, the sticky stuff, you'll get the naked breadboard you saw in the video. That's just how you see the inside of the breadboard. And I think that's a cool way of learning how it works. Any more questions? And that was a question, but... <laughs> so, so, so to reiterate, we shouldn't be thinking uh, no, no, that was just for demonstration. That breadboard was dead. It was dead to me. All right. Feels like so annoying when it comes to like where things are. So the next video is building circuits. Now that you know how to, how breadboards works, let's take a look at how we actually build a circuit on it. Okay. Now that we've learned how to use a breadboard, let's go ahead and construct our very first circuit. So this is the circuit we're going to be constructing on a breadboard, and this is known as an LED driver circuit. So all we're doing is just connecting 5 volts to an LED, but adding some resistors in between so that we don't get too much current through the LED and break it. Now it's a fairly simple circuit, but when we're first building on the breadboard, we have to identify a few things. First of all, we have to identify which part of the circuits are actually connected to each other. We've learned from before that the breadboard is connected in a strange way from the power rail to the internal circuit. In the internal circuit, things are connected together horizontally. So 
if you have a signal on, let's say, the 12th row on the left side and a signal on the right one, they are connected together as like a wire. It's like an internal wire inside the breadboard. Therefore, it's the same thing as saying, if the end of this 330 ohm resistor is connected together with this LED, these two connections have to be on the same row, or there must be a jumper wire going from this component to this component. Since this is a simple circuit, we can go ahead and place the end of the 330 ohm resistor with the LED, so this can all be on something like row 12. Therefore, we can put the end of the 330 ohm wire in the left of row 12, and then put the beginning of the LED on row 12 as well. And that will make a single connection because it is a single wire. Same thing for the other one. So the LED, LED's end is not going to be on the same wire as row 12, otherwise you'll cause a short circuit because the LED has to be on the negative end after it reaches the other side. It has to reach ground in order for it to turn on. In this case, the end of the LED cannot be on row 12 anymore. It must be on some other row. Whatever else row it is, we don't really care because as long as it's not connected to the same row, we are fine if we're jumping a connection. In this case, the end of the LED, the negative end of the LED, is connected to the positive end of this 330 ohm resistor. Therefore, if we have the negative end, or this is also known as the cathode of the LED, we can have the cathode on the, let's say, row 16, on the right of row 16. We have jumped from row 12 to row 16. Then we, have, we can have the beginning of the 330 ohm resistor on row 16 as well. That way, it forms a short circuit. And it connects the end of the LED to the beginning of the 330 ohm resistor. Now, the end of the 30 ohm, 300, 330 ohm resistor is connected straight to ground. Therefore, we can take the end of the 330 ohm resistor from row 16 and connect it to the blue rail. The blue rail is also known as the ground, or where the ground is stored. Now, going from the very beginning, we can see we have one more connection that we don't know where it goes, which is the beginning of the 330 ohm resistor. This is connected directly to 5 volts, so this would be the red rail. Since the red rail always stands for VCC. Awesome. So now that we know where everything is connected, let's go ahead and construct this on our actual breadboard. Let me pick this up for reference. Okay, so I have my pocket breadboard out here, and I have successfully wired the positive end and the negative end of the binding post to the breadboard. You can see that I have a wire going from the red uh, binding post to the red end of the pocket breadboard, and also the black binding post going to the ground or the blue rail of the breadboard. So what we do next is we want to start building our circuit. Um, now the first component that we must put on our breadboard is a 330 ohm resistor. We can see that it goes from the red rail to row 12. In this case, we can do that very simply. So I'm going to go from the red rail to row 12. Now, resistors are not polarized, which means you can flip them around and they'll still do the same behavior. An LED is polarized, which means you have to have the positive end um, and the negative end on very specific locations. So if you're analyzing an LED, which the LED sometimes looks like this, the longer le leg is usually always the positive end and the shorter leg is always the negative end, which is why in a previous demonstration, I went ahead and cut the LED even with the component gauge to a longer and short leg so that I can remember it. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and then connect the end of the 330 ohm resistor to the beginning of the LED or the anode of the LED. In this case, I will go ahead and place the LED's longer leg inside the 12th row. Something like this. Now, because I cut the LED, it's not going to go to row 16. I can't stretch it out to row 16. It's going to go to row 13 instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to row 13. That was just a design error. And we're going to connect now the beginning of the 330 ohm resistor to the end of the LED, to the negative end of the LED. So something like this. We have our cut 330 ohm resistor here. I'm going to place it on the negative end of the LED. And we have to connect the 330 ohm resistor to ground. 
So the end of that will go straight to ground. Now, since we previously cut these components using the component gauge, we can see that this circuit is now complete and it's very neat to look at. We can see that the power is going to travel from the red binding post into the breadboard, go through this rail vertically into this resistor, travel through the resistor into this LED because the horizontal pins are connected on the main circuit, travel through the LED, go to row 13, travel through this resistor and into the ground. And into the ground means that it'll go down this rail, into this wire, up this wire, and into ground. So let's test if this circuit works. If this circuit works, what we should see is this LED lighting up. Now this is a white LED. So I have five volts on my power source, and I'm going to take these two wires and connect them into the binding post of the pocket breadboard. So by connecting them, the alligator clips into the terminal blocks, we can see that the LED lights up. Therefore, this circuit has been constructed correctly. Now let me show you what happens if the circuit is not constructed correctly. So let me go ahead and remove these alligator clips. You must always remove your power before editing your circuit, otherwise you may short yourself, hurt yourself, um, and other bad things. So what you do is a lot of um, first-time circuit constructors may flip the LED and accidentally put the longer leg on the other side. So if we put this LED backwards, the behavior we can see happen is that the LED won't turn on. And this is normal behavior because the diode is in, is in reverse bias mode, which means that the current can't travel through it backwards. The diode is preventing the current from traveling from the positive end to the negative end. So the diode is not broken, the LED is not broken. All you need to do is flip it once more. So the most common mistake with LEDs is putting them backwards. And what I just did there is not okay. Um, you must actually um, unplug the power before flipping the LED uh, because this is a, such a low current um, component, it is fine to do safely. So now we can see that um, our LED is turned on successfully and we can go ahead and disconnect the power and finish testing our circuit. And that is how you uh, construct a circuit on a breadboard. Thank you for watching. Okay, so I'm gonna test the audio again to make sure that you can hear me. I think the audio is coming from here. Um, well, I just want to point out that uh, what I did at the end there, do, um, when you have a more complex circuit, you want to make sure you turn the power off before editing it, like every single time, unless you're like 8,000% certain like what the circuit is, um, make sure you turn it off because unexpected things can happen. An LED circuit is pretty simple to build um, and there's a very low chance of you hurting yourself. But if you build something with transistors and diodes and five timers, like you just touching the IC chip uh, can cause something called ESD, electrostatic discharge. It's some electricity passing from your body to the chip that kills it. Now, a lot of you know commercial PCBs do have ESD protection, which means that you can like touch and feel the PCB without it, you know, like destroying itself. But just in general, know that your human body is electrified and that you can probably destroy something just by touching um, electronic components. So Again, safety notice, before editing your circuit, make sure there's no power running through it. Yes, question. Uh, I just wanted, uh, can you remind me which side is the positive side and which one is the negative side? The longer leg of an LED is the positive side. So longer leg is positive, shorter leg is negative. This is so important that I had to put it on my new uh, Blinky Learner PCB. It's actually a picture on there that says longer leg is positive, shorter leg is negative. Yes. That was just for a demonstration. It was like, there's no real use for it. So you're right. Um, basically, I could have replaced it with a 660 ohm resistor, and, and it would have been it would have been the exact same thing. Uh, but I just wanted to use a resistor instead of a jumper wire, honestly, because I'm lazy. So that's why the second one's there. But in reality, for an LED, you can just use 330 ohms. And a little bit about that resistance, real quick. So in your kit, you'll have um, resistors of 330 ohms, 1,000 ohms, 2,000 ohms, and 10,000 ohms. Um, of course, there's a lot more resistor values out there in the world. These are just some of the most common ones that are going to be used in challenges for this uh, workshop. Um, 
And for these LEDs, the LEDs are actually what's known as super bright LEDs, which means that if you put 330 ohms and 9 volts through them, they have the ability to blind you. So um, just be careful about that. Take note of it. I've put some like safety in the design so that you don't do that, but like don't stare in the like top of the LED or else you'll blind yourself. Because I've done that before. It's a temporary blindness, but still not very uh, very safe to do. Like you'll see dark spots for a while. Uh, okay. Right, using multimeter, right? Well, was that good for everyone in the room to hear? Okay, awesome. Um, just making sure the audio is working. All right, using a multimeter. In this video, we'll be going over how to use a multimeter to figure out the voltage, current, and resistance in different parts of the circuit. This multimeter has a big knob in the middle, which you can turn to measure either the voltage, resistance, or the current. So what we're going to do is analyze the bottom three ports first. We can see that the black plug is uh, plugged into the COM port, which stands for ground. And the red one is currently plugged into the fused V ohm MA. This stands for the voltage, resistance, and low amounts of current. If we want to measure low amounts of current below 500 milli milliamps, we're going to go ahead and plug the red wire into the fused port. If we want to measure anything higher, we plug it into the 10 amp max. Um, and if we measure anything above 500 milliamps using the red wire, we'll blow the fuse in the back. In the back of the multimeter, there are two fuses, one for the 500 milliamp maximum and one for the 10 amp maximum. If we exceed the fuse, the little wire in the middle of it will break and it will not allow us to measure any current from the multimeter anymore. The numbers on the multimeter represent the scale of whatever we're measuring. So for example, if we're measuring uh, resistance, the multimeter will not let us measure anything above 200 ohms when the setting is on 200. Similarly, if we change it to 2000, it will not let us measure anything over 2000. We're going to use this circuit to demonstrate some of the multimeter applications in, um, in this video. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to measure the resistance of these resistors. Let's say I got the circuit fresh and brand new and I don't know exactly what the resistance is. So I'm going to go ahead and measure it. And measuring this resistance, I can see that the multimeter does not... I know personally that these resistors are 330 ohms. And because I have my resistor on a 200 setting, it's not going to let me exceed that. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and switch it to 2000 and try to measure it again. Now, when I put my two probes across the resistor, it shows me that it has a resistance of 328 ohms. This resistor is a 330 ohm, but it's a lot of 1% of tolerance, so that's as close as it's going to get. Now, notice that I don't have power running through the circuit when I measure resistance. This is very important. Um, because if you have voltage and current running through the circuit, uh, you're not going to be able to measure resistance through the multimeter. So for resistance, always turn the power off before measuring the devices. Now we're going to measure voltage, and voltage is a similar story. If I want to measure anything from like 0 volts to 20 volts, I'm going to go ahead and switch my multimeter to the 20 setting. Now this is the most common one. If you want to measure like higher DC voltages, you can go ahead and change it to 200 maximum limit, or 500 if you wish. I'm going to turn the power on on my power source, and my power source currently says it has 5.04 volts. And so I'm going to go ahead and on my pocket breadboard, I'm going to put the LEDs on the metal parts of the breadboard. And this will form a connection between the positive and ground of my multimeter when measuring voltage. And it says 5.05 voltages or 5.06, which is really close to what my power source says. So my power source is over here. And it says 5.05 to verify that. Now, when measuring voltage, you want to connect your probes to the circuit in parallel, which means you can go ahead and measure like this the voltage across this resistor by putting your probes right across it. And it seems like the voltage across this resistor is 1.16 volts. Now, if I want to measure the voltage across this resistor, the one on the right, I can go ahead and put my probes here, and it says it has 1.16 volts drop. Now, due to KVL, because this is an entire series circuit where the power will go from the resistor to the LED to the other resistor back to ground, we know that the voltages measured in the circuit must add up to 5 volts. But 1.16 plus 1.16 does not add up to 5 volts. So where is the other voltage? 
Well, we can measure that by putting our resistor LEDs on the top of the two resistors so that it's measuring through the LED. And we can see that the LED has a voltage drop of 2.73, which represents that the LED has a turn on voltage of 2.7, which means if there's not more than 2.7 volts going through the LED, it will not turn on. Therefore, that calculation should add up close to 5.06 volts on our multimeter. In addition, you can do some fun things. Like if you want to measure um, each node voltage with respect to ground, all you can do is put the black lead of the multimeter on the ground pin and then start poking around the circuit. You can measure the voltage from this point. So from this point, uh, you have a 3.89 volts drop from this point in ground. At this point, you have 1.16 volts. And if you have from this point, which is the entire circuit, you have five volts. So using a multimeter, you can test, um, you can test basically the voltage throughout the entire circuit at different nodes. Now, when measuring current, this is the danger one, um, because it has the most ability, most capability to blow out your multimeter. You cannot measure current with the same technique, uh, technique as the voltage. Like you can't put it across in parallel um, and measure the current there because it would break. Current must be measured by putting the resistor LEDs in series with the circuit. So I'm going to edit this circuit a little bit so that I can measure the current across it. I'm going to take this resistor and I'm going to place it on a different line so that it's not directly connected to power or 5 volts. So after I have placed it inside the breadboard, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the power. Because the resistor is no longer connected to the 5 volts or VCC of the breadboard, the LED will not turn on because it is a broken circuit. In order to connect our multimeter in series with the rest of the circuit, we're going to put our current limit to 200 milliamps. Now I know that the LED will not draw more than 500 milliamps, so I can measure it with the fused setting. Otherwise, I must change the plug to 10 amps max and then measure it from there. So I'm going to go ahead and place my uh, red LED on the 5 volts or VCC pin, and I'm going to put my black one on the beginning of this 330 ohm. I'm going to close the circuit by using my multimeter. The moment I do that, I should see the LED light up. So the current is traveling through the red um, LED into the multimeter, processing it, coming out the black LED, and going through the rest of the circuit. So in this scenario, I can see that I have about 3 0.5 milliamps going through the circuit of current. Now, because this is a series circuit, if I do this with any other connection, um, I should be able to see the same result. I should still be able to see 3.5 milliamps because this is a series circuit and current stays the same throughout the entire series circuit. So let me test that theory by moving this resistor um, back to the 5 volts, and then I'm going to disconnect it with the LED. So that is the wrong port, that is ground. Just do it over here. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and lift the LED a little bit up so I can access it while connecting the current and turn on my power source again. So this time what I'm gonna do is the current is going to travel through the red, um, red line into this resistor and I'm gonna put my red LED here. That means the current's now traveling through the multimeter and I want to travel out through the LED. So I'm going to go ahead and put my black wire at the LED. And now it lights up. So the current is traveling through the multimeter, through the red LED, into the multimeter, out the back LED, and into the LED, which we can see has 3.5 milliamps traveling through it. So it doesn't matter where you measure current throughout the circuit. If it's a series circuit, it should all stay the same. Now for the last demonstration, I'm going to be performing a continuity test. A continuity test is um, a test that determines whether two points of a wire are continuous. So for example, if you are wiring something bigger, like a circuit for an LED or something for a drone, and you want to make sure that the two points of a, a circuit or a line have connection with each other, you will switch your multimeter setting to this symbol right here, which looks like a diode with a Wi-Fi symbol or a loudspeaker symbol. Um, the multimeter will emit a sound if the two points measured between the uh, LEDs are connected to each other. So in this case, we have connection 
between the two metal parts and we hear a sound. So what I can do is, let's say this is a more complex wiring, I can put my red side here, my black side to the other side, and then measure them both. And we can see that this jumper wire is connected. There is a signal going from one side to the other. We can do this with a bigger circuit, such as this one. If we go ahead and put the circuit back, and you want to do this with the power off. So right now my power source is off, and if I want to make sure that there's a connection going between, let's say, the resistor and the LED, I can go ahead and put my red LED here, my black LED on the LED, and we can see that, yes, current will travel from the LED, um, from the resistor to the LED when the power is turned on. When the power is turned on, we see that as correct. So this has been a brief guide on how to use a multimeter. Um, I hope you enjoy. That was um, a tutorial on how to use a multimeter. Before we go on, I'm going to pause. Okay, so are there any questions for multimeters? Yes. Is the delta measure in the current in a series circuit? Is it the same technique to measure the current in a parallel circuit? Yes, so the question was for the technique on measuring, a, uh, measuring current in a series circuit, is it the same as measuring current in a parallel circuit? Yes, you still have to break the circuit apart at the two points you want to measure it, and then put the basically put the current through the multimeter first. But never ever measure the current um, in like parallel. Do not put the two LEDs directly on like a resistor while the power is on, for example, because then that's a short circuit, right? You're basically having a short circuit through the multimeter, and with that, you're going to break the fuse. You're going to blow the fuse. In the multimeter, there's two fuses: one for the 500 milliamps and one for the 10 amps. If you blow the fuse, you're going to see zero, zero, zero when you're trying to measure the current through the circuit. And if you know there's current through the circuit uh, and you know the multimeter is broken, then you have to do what's called a fuse replacement. It's actually very simple. All you got to do is unscrew the back, replace this little like cylinder-like structure. A fuse is simply an electrical component that has a small little wire going through it that if you put too much uh, current, the wire breaks. So then you just have to replace that little glass tube and you're good to go. Yes. Yes. So that's why I moved the resistor and measured it in series rather than parallel. So how about we do the video? I'll go back to the video real quick. Once again. Circuit. Same results. Actually. It... Okay. So like this here, the circuit's broken when I move the resistor from the power line to this random row. In order to connect the circuit again, I have to place my multimeter leads on the red power line and then the top of the resistor. That feeds the current through the multimeter and back to the circuit so that it can measure how much current is going through it. Yes? Um, so, like, what's the difference between, like, why would we want to use the 200 milliamp measuring, uh, measuring mode if it's, like, too powerful? Like, is, it, is, it, is it, like, uh, 200 milliamp more precise? Precision is a thing. There's no such thing as 2,000 milliamp uh, if you're talking about current. This just shows the limit of what you're measuring. So it can, this setting can measure up to 200 milliamps. This can measure up to 20 milliamps, for example. So as you like, it would get larger and larger. If you want to measure up to 10 amps, this is the setting you're going to use. But why would you use something that's like, why would you limit that it's like lower? Why would you just use like 10 amps all the time? Why would you use like 200 milliamps or 20 milliamps? So the question is, why would you use the 20 amp milliamp limit instead of 10 amp? So for the first thing, um, you don't measure 10 amps until you um, move the pin on the bottom to the actual 10 amp fuse, because they're two separate fuses. If you try measuring 10 amps on you know, the 500 milliamp fuse, your multimeter is going to break. The fuse is going to blow up. right? So what you want to do is you want to measure at 200 milliamps. That's probably the safest. If you want to get more precise, go for 20 milliamps as a limit. And again, it's all about precision. So again, you wouldn't measure like 200 mega ohms if you're measuring like a 330 ohm resistor because you're not even going to see it on the actual multimeter. It's just going to say zero, right? And uh, if you have questions in uh, DBHS, feel free to ask them. Uh, my point of contact is Yash, so I can just answer them here through the Zoom. Are there any more questions for multimeter? Yes. Is the multimeter 
do not measure current in parallel. That's correct. So never, ever, ever, while the power is on, put the multimeter lens across something because that's creating a short circuit. It's basically feeding the current through the multimeter, which is like almost zero resistance, back into the circuit. So it's going to blow the fuse inside of it. Any other questions? Do not measure current in parallel. So do not take the multimeter LEDs and then put it across a resistor or across any other component because you're making a short circuit, right? You're making a short circuit across the multimeter instead of through the resistor because current travels through the path of least resistance. So it's all going to go through the multimeter and not through a circuit. Yes? So it's fine until I pull it through the resistance to measure parallel. Yes. So again, let's go to the restrictions for voltage and resistance. For voltage, you've got to turn the power on and then measure in parallel. For resistor, no power. So when you're measuring the resist value of a resistor, do not turn on the power or else it won't work. But yes, resistor, for measuring resistance, you can just put it um, in parallel as well. You guys will get a chance to play with a multimeter in the lab. Uh, we have some special multimeters for you there. Exact same model. 15 bucks on Amazon. Any other questions? Nope? All right. Glad we started that. I think the next one's the last one. Oh yes, my favorite one. Um, for those of you who actually know me in real life, um, I love wiring circuits like as close and as firm to the breadboard as possible um, in order to avoid what's called a rasp nest. Now, I don't have a picture of a rasp nest here, and I don't know exactly why, so I'm just going to search one up right now. So a rasp nest um, in electronics, no, I don't want to do this. Looks something like this. It's a, it's a mess of cables. And cable organization is like an art form inside circuit design. You want to make sure your cables are as neat as possible and like not like this. Because you have a cable that looks like this, you give it to a friend, say, hey, something's wrong with my circuit. Can you check this out for me? <laughs> They're going to have a, a fun time trying to figure out what's wrong. So in order to avoid doing this, we do uh, circuit wiring, and uh, we're going to go over how to do neat circuit wiring in this video. Whenever it loads. Okay. In this video, I'll be demonstrating how to cut neat wires for your breadboard. Wires that are flush with the breadboard and not sticking up um, and confusing you in, in terms of troubleshooting, or just making your circuit um, a very difficult place to read. If you use an automatic wire stripper, kind of like this one, and you feed your wire into it, when you press the um, two sides to close it, you'll see that the wire cuts successfully. Something like this. When the wire has a naked end, you can pr put it into your breadboard, and the rest of the wire will be isolated from view. The rubber coating is not conductive, therefore electrical signals cannot pass through it. In this example, I have placed the LED um, across the bridge from the rest of the circuit. Therefore, we will need some way of connecting the dots, connecting um, the circuit from one side to the other. And normally you could do something like this. Let's say I have the other end already cut and prepared. You can do something like this. I can go ahead and put a wire on one side and then the wire on the other side, and you know, this would work. But if you have a large circuit and you have like so many wires, it's gonna be really hard to distinguish which wire is which if you have um, every single wire being way longer than it should be. So what I'm gonna do is instruct you how to make flush wires to the breadboard. The way you do it is there is a trick. So go ahead and put the end of the wire in the starting point of where you want um, to connect to, and then let's say I want to have the um, ending point be on the other side of the bridge for this uh, pin right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna press the wire flush with the breadboard as if it's already inside of it, even though it's not cut yet. And then from the location where I want to put the, um, put the wire in, I'm gonna take out the LED so we can uh, be a little more exact here. I'm going to count two squares. So in this case, I want my um, end of the wire to be on the second hole. So I'm going to count one, two. And then on the end of the second hole, I'm going to make a cut. 
Now, if you kept the same settings for your automatic wire cutter, if you take this little piece of wire and feed it in and make a connection here, what you have now is a wire that should be perfectly sectioned or perfectly uh, measured to fit your connection. So I can directly put the wire into my breadboard and you can see that it is flush with the breadboard and um, it is not sticking out anymore. So that is how you make exact connections with um, tw your 22 gauge jumper wire. So I'm gonna do this once more, just as a demonstration. I have my cut wire here. I'm going to plug it into the breadboard and then press it flat against the rest of the breadboard. Now I want to make the connection um, to the second pin. So I'm gonna count one, two, little pins away from it, and then cut it at the end of the second pin. Something like that. And then I can take the little wire now and strip off the rest of the insulation on the other end of it on my automatic wire cutter. Like that. And then bend it into shape. Now I can already tell that this wire is a little bit shorter than the other one, but it should be okay. So then I can take my little wire and place it inside my breadboard. And you can see that although it is a little bit shorter than the other one, we can still have a nice little flat connection between one pin and one row to another row. Therefore, if I put my LED back into the circuit, we can very clearly see where the current is going to go through the circuit. The current's gonna travel from the red wires through the resistor, through this yellow wire to the other side of the bridge, through the LED, back through the right yellow wire, back through the resistor and into ground, therefore completing a series circuit. And if I go ahead and plug it into my power source, my benchtop power supply, I can see that the LED turns on when power is sent through it. And I can very clearly see what the yellow wire's purpose is for in the breadboard by, by sending current from one side to the other. So that is how you make really neat connections and clear up some space on your breadboard and not make it look like a rat's nest. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video and I hope you have a great day. People on Zoom in here, that's all repeated. And that's how you cut jumper wires to size. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Are you gonna connect a wire diagonally? Is there another way to gauge it? So, okay, here's the thing about you know circuit wirings. Um, from your component gauge, I previously said that the component gauge is about six millimeters, right? And six millimeters is basically all the way through the breadboard. When you go two squares over, each square has a distance of about 2.54 millimeters. That's kind of like the standard. It's 100 mil or uh, 0 0.1 inches. Um, when you go diagonally, you can just estimate it. So it's about a little less than two squares in that case. Yeah, the two squares rule is just like a way of um, gauging how far it is when you cut it. The more you do this technique, the like, better you'll get at um, recognizing when to cut it. And um, soon you, you'll even need the two squares trip. Like you can cut it diagonally and it'll still be like that. Yeah, so that, was, that question was for if you're, what if you're connecting uh, wires diagonally? Any other questions? Okay, so that is, yes. Question? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, awesome. So, yeah. So the question was, when we do we turn the power all the way back to zero? At the end of every test. So reset your power supply after every test so that the next time you use it, if you like directly connect your jumper cables to your circuit immediately and turn the power source on, which I've done before, you don't just like provide way more voltage to your circuit than needed. So always at the end of your test. Okay. So that was the last video I have um, describing, you know, circuit techniques. Uh, it's already 6.12, um, but I still have some more to go. So we'll just go, there's three sections. There's not 10 sections. It's not like before, <laughs> all right? So I, I, I did some moderation this time around. I should probably stand in front of the camera.
OK, so this is sorted kit components. So let's see what is exactly inside your sorted kits. What's in your kit? A lot of crap. Um, so all of this by retail costs about $30 um, in, you know, for assembling, fees, whatever. But you get a lot of things. In this case, um, this kit was specifically designed for this workshop series, which means all of the challenges that I'm going to introduce to you guys next will use basically all of these parts in the kit. Right, so you have breadboards, your pocket breadboard, resistors of four different kinds, an alligator banana clip. You know, I actually put this in because as, as like a student myself, I've come to like recognize in labs way too often I don't have this. Because like no one has this. Like banana plugs are like so hard to come by. And like you can't use alligator clips either because the lab equipment here is terrible. Like it just randomly breaks at times. This is very useful equipment. You also have LEDs of five different colors, buttons of five different colors, SPSD switches, capacitors, transistors, diodes, terminal block, terminal block connectors, uh, a trim potentiometer. I, I like this one. It's really satisfying. It's like a little knob for potentiometer. Uh, you have a 9 volt battery plus its clip, an LM317 voltage regulator, an LM7805 fixed voltage regulator, a 5.1 volt Zener diode, 555 timers, and component gauges. Um, so these two I included just because we talked about them last week. So uh, we, you're going to actually apply what you learned and regulate some voltage in, in this lab. OK, a few safety rules uh, before we go to the lab. This is a really important slide. Just make sure you guys don't like, electrocute yourself. Hey, do not leave power supplies unattended. So always make sure that you have full control of your power supplies. You know exactly what's on it every single time. And if you're not using it, turn it off. Because you know someone might come over, touch the LEDs, give them some little shock. You know, things happen. So make sure you turn off powers after circuit testing. Make sure to turn off the power before making edits to your circuit. So you know if you have a more complex circuit with a 555 timer and you touch your circuit and you try to like move the IC, you may short something and then it turns into like a fire safety hazard. So make sure you turn off the power before making edits to your circuit. Wear closed toed shoes and tie your hair back. Um, you know this goes for any like lab feel, but you know. Your feet are valuable. Your hair is also valuable. Don't lose it to experience. Yes. Oh, and to turn on the power supply, we just like turn every single knob to zero, and then zero, zero. Yes, correct. Yes. You're not wearing shoes. Um. <laughs> no, I always wear them. No, I always don't wear them as well. But uh, if you want to be real safe, yeah, just, I think it's a. You're just you're just a better resistor. Yeah, don't let your feet touch the ground. It's because that will complete a circuit. Don't let your feet touch the ground. I should, you should be. You should be. Yeah, no, you should be fine. It's not that. Now for the soldering lab. Oh yeah, no, for the soldering lab. Not let you, make, I'm not let you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put in the announcement yeah. before we do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, four shoes. Okay, next safety rule: keep your station neat and tidy. Now I am a. I really like. Cleaning up after myself because you know after a big big like experiment, Sam knows from thirty three hundred one you got like wires everywhere, wire strips everywhere. Yeah, like dirty workshops. Dirty workshops are terrible. So make sure all your little resistor LEDs are um, put away in like a little pile so you can dump it away. Make sure all your little insulations from your like wires are all like neat and tidy. You don't want to you know drop a resistor LED on the ground, have it spear through someone's foot and get sued. So. Throw away insulation scraps and throw away resistor bolts. When sharing equipment, hand off sharp objects by the handle. I don't have a sharp object here. Um, I can give it away, but um, sure. Okay. Let's say this thing is like a sharp object. Oh, it's got a sharp object. Okay. You guys are going to be sharing your equipment during the lab, and this goes for like any sort of like sharp object, whether it's just like that little thing or like scissors or like a um, wire cutter, whatever you do, do not give it away like this. Because what if you just trip and you like, like you know, spear it. To give away sharp equipment, always do it by the handle. So at, at the most part, you're gonna like spear yourself. I'm kidding, but like best practice, give it away by the handle so that the person receiving it can take it by the handle and not by the plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just, it's just a defensive thing. <laughs> yeah. So those are the safety um, tips I have for you guys. Any questions on these? No? Uh, 
All right, let's go ahead and talk about what you guys are going to be building. Uh, now, I didn't tell much of this, but Masha, I want you to, I want you to like just take down everyone who completes these challenges because you might get a little bit of a reward afterwards. So come see me if you like finish them out a little bit. Yes, so show a helper or a gamer or whatever you want to call yourselves. <laughs> she told me to call you that. I know. <laughs> so go see uh, one of the assistants if you have completed a circuit challenge they'll write your name down and you might get some uh, goodies after the workshop first challenge very easy led driver it may sound like an easy circuit but i've already built it in a tutorial so it's something you can follow you guys will get this powerpoint later on don't worry i'll send it in the hyperloop general channel channel so you can have it as well uh, the tasks here are just to design a circuit that can turn on an led using one button and or an spst switch now, the challenge becomes when you're turning on multiple LEDs. Now, who remembers what I said about diodes and voltage drops in the last workshop? What oh, yeah. That's a great. I think you said that's like a, the diode gets like a 0 0.7 voltage drop. Right. And? In the current only works Right. Correct. Good. So for regular diodes, the voltage drop is around 0 0.7 volts. Who knows what the voltage drop is for an LED? A little bit too high. It's around 2.7. Uh, 2.5, 2.7 for like a white LED. Um, it's like 1.5 for a red LED. There's big specifications. The different like color LEDs have different voltage yeah. limits. So that's why you have like a lot of um, colors there. You can figure it out. Like I think green is green's the worst. It's like 3.5 again. Green or blue? I'm not sure. So light blue. Light blue is the worst. I'm just saying right in front of these speakers. <laughs> okay, Do so you remember like the drop off uh, the drop off value for like each color? No, no, you don't. If you want to get that technical, uh, go into lasers. <laughs> go into optics. optics. Yeah, that'll be fun. So the big challenge is powering multiple LEDs in series. So for two LEDs, you're still safe. Let's say each LED has a three volt voltage drop. You're powering using a nine volt battery, then each LED would receive like more than three volts, and it'll turn off. If you're trying to connect like four LEDs in series, though, that's going to be an issue because now like four LEDs are going to want like three volts each. That's like 12 volts in total. KBL doesn't like that because you're only powering in a 9 volt battery. So how do you power four LEDs on? Put it in parallel. That's the trick for this. And so um, in parallel, each LED will receive the same voltage because they all share the same node. All you got to worry about now is them getting enough current each because now the current splits up into all four LEDs. Like, yeah, but like Christmas trees like have like no, low voltage drops. It's typically three in series in parallel. Yeah, yeah, every every cycle. Yeah, so that's usually. So what Sam said about Christmas tree lights, they are connected both in series and parallel, so that you know they're not a long string of LEDs. But that's a discussion for later. So that's why normally one blows out, but when that cluster blows out, it is if the that circuit is incomplete, it becomes smaller. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk closer to the mic for the students. Sorry. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'll talk. I'll talk about it later. That's yeah, it. yeah. But what, what, what the what about the LEDs? Was that if one goes out, a whole cluster of them goes out because um, some of them are connected in series, some of them are connected in parallel. It's annoying. Okay, this is the first challenge. It's pretty simple. Next challenge is regulators. So I want you guys to build some regulators, which um, are a safety mechanism, but also cool to find out. This is where you get to play with your multimeter to make sure you get the right voltage. So you have three challenges for this, well, three sub-challenges. You are to construct a voltage regulator from two resistors that produce a gain of one half. So a gain of one half just means your voltage output is one half of its input. So this would be um, a voltage divider, and I have a schematic for you on the next slide. The next challenge is pretty much the same thing, except now you have a gain of one quarter. So it would be three resistors from your kit. Now, um, I designed these challenges to work with the components in your kit, so it should be, all be done using those, with the exception of the last challenge. I'll go over that later. Um, the constructive voltage regulator from the LM7805 and the LM317 to produce a fixed output voltage of 3.75. So what I want you guys to do is to power the circuit using 9 volts, feed it through the LM7805 to get 5 volts, and then perform this calculation here to find out which R2 and R1 value that you have will get you 3.75 volts. So it's a combination of the resistors you have. It's like a puzzle. But I, I promise. And um, this is what the LM7805 looks like on the bottom right corner of the screen. That's that circuit, and you can see the R1's on top, R2's on the bottom. Here's the circuits. Um, so the first two, I've, I've blanked out the resistor values because I want you to figure that out yourself. But um, that's the circuits. 
for the um, voltage, voltage dividers, and then here's the circuit for the LM7805 and LM317. Um, you're going to need some capacitors just for like noise reduction. Okay. I'm going to move my webcam so like it's not blocking, it's not like blocking it. This circuit is known as the latch. It's called an SR latch, which stands for a set reset latch. Now, don't copy this down all in your notes if you're taking notes because I don't want to do that either. This took me 30 minutes to make on multi sim. So, an SR latch is a cool little circuit that is basically one bit of memory. So, if you're going into like architecture or stuff like that, um, basically what happens if you close this switch, this LED will turn on. And then, if you like flip the switch on and off, nothing will change to the LED. It has been latched open. That means the memory has been saved in this circuit so that you know, your zero is now a one. In order to reset it back to a zero, all you gotta do is press the switch, which is a reset switch. That's why I'm set, reset, S, R, right? So you're gonna build a circuit. You have two transistors in the circuit forming this kind of like system here. This is the data sheet for the transistor. It's also in the description. So the data sheet is also available for you. Just making sure that you know which side is the base, emitter, and collector. These, these types of transistors are not symmetric, so it, it can mess this up. It does matter, yes, because the emitter has an arrow to it. So to construct the circuit, I already gave you the bill of materials, basically just a, a list of components you'll need. So you'll have um, two transistors, one LED, four 1K ohm resistors, four 10K ohm resistors, one 330 ohm resistor, two multicolor buttons, one 9 volt battery, or a power supply unit. Um, now, this circuit is a little more complicated. It's actually the most complicated circuit um, in this entire challenge. I mean, according to, I don't know why it's called medium, uh, but you know, we're not getting to 5 5 timers yet. I think that's the reason. So um, you'll notice that I also put Q and not Q here in like digital logic when you have like a flip flop, which is pretty much what this thing is. Uh, you'll have a Q output, which is like your expected output, and then not Q, which is the opposite of it. So this thing is like zero, this thing's got to be one. If this is one, this is going to be zero. So in case you want to use this circuit for some other application and you want to use the inverse of that, here you go. You can do things like twos complement, um, subtraction, binary, other cool things. Okay, next is touch switch. So this is a cool one because you're basically electrocuting yourself safely. So you're building the circuit which this is called a Darlington pair. A Darlington pair is when you connect two transistors in this formation and it amplifies the current immensely. Basically what you're doing is you want to open this transistor so that the LED can reach ground and light up, right? The only way to open this transistor is if you feed current into the base. Once you feed current into the base, this goes into saturation mode, so these two wires connect. When these two wires connect, it allows the LED to light up. So the only way for this transistor to open is if this transistor opens first, right? And the only way this transistor is going to open is if you feed current into this transistor through this kind of system here. So your human body has around 100k ohms of resistance. It's less if you touch soapy water, even less if you touch like warm soapy water that has salt in it. Basically, um, different parts of the human body have different sort of um, resistances. Your tongue has even less resistance because it's like wet and slimy. That's why if you like lick a battery, you'll like taste something metallic because you're electrocuting your tongue. Don't like the battery, it's like very unsafe. I mean, unsanitary. It's not unsafe, but it's unsanitary. So, um, what you're going to do is you're going to build a circuit, and basically, when you touch the naked wires, the LED is going to light up. This is a touch sensitive circuit. You're basically passing current through your body, and it gets amplified through these two transistors. I just think that's cool. So, you're going to need these components to make that circuit, and then you're going to go ahead and try to get these LED light to light up by touching the wires. This is Blinky Learner. How many of you guys have constructed Blinky Learner last semester? Raise your hands. Oh, a few of you. So Blinky Learner was our soldering workshop last semester where we made this kind of PCB with a blinking circuit. I want you guys to build it now on a breadboard. So before I made it into a PCB, what I did was I went ahead and built it on a breadboard first to make sure that it works, and then went ahead and constructed the PCB. So this is like your step before you make a PCB, which is next week, by the way. Next week is PCB Design Workshop. If you haven't registered for it, you should. On our website. So what you got, what you got here is just a five minute timer. This is kind of like a one of the key components in electronics to create some 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 kind of clock signal. So by connecting everything in this formation, what you get is these two blinking on and off. 
and um, you have this like little switch here to turn it off and on the circuit. It's pretty cool. Yes. So a clock signal is a formation of zeros and ones, like repeatedly, that toggle on and off at a specific frequency. So it can be like 10k hertz. Uh, your computer has a clock in it. Your computer's clock is like in gigahertz almost. Oh, oh, I, I thought you were talking about the plug. Oh, yeah. 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 You, you need it as a reference. Because the thing is, is that, like, for, for, for the computer, um, oh, it's the back. I'm sorry. It's a back. <laughs> um, so, in order for. I think you get it closer to this. Yes. Okay. In order for this kind of thing to work, right, you need to have a known speed, right? Because here's the deal like, any of this stuff is instantaneous. Dude. <laughs> Dude. Dude. Man, they're going to see like my pores. Dude. <laughs> so in order for this stuff to work, you need to have some kind of signal that basically tells you how far your, how far like that signal has gone in a certain time period. Like, how do you know what a second is? Right. Right. But where does that intuition come from? It came, from like, it came from like your previous standpoint of this one, right? So the idea is, is that from that intuition, it was formed from something. And I'm assuming it maybe was some kind of like clock, like maybe your grandmother's clock, which is a mechanical method of doing it, or maybe like your iPhone, which is relayed through a very complex set of satellites that have, you know, radium sitting inside a chamber that we can figure out the half-life off of it, whatever the case may be. A second is a it is not like it's a theoretical thing that has been defined and everybody just agrees on it right the same thing goes with this thing to the circuit it has no idea like what a second is until you define it against that set frequency right per second kind of thing so if i say that i set up a crystal clock in there inside your circuit that resonates at 10 hertz per second i know that every 10 times i count that I can guarantee that that's going to be ten, a second, right? If I can count 10 of that frequency, right? And computers are really good at counting, right? So therefore, what you can do is you can define that second per how much that crystal clock is being defined. And what's cool about these crystal clocks is it's, it's literally a crystal. Like you see them, like these little like metal insulators or something like that. And all you have to do is give it a certain voltage and it gives out that signal that you can define. It's really cool, right? Um, it's uh, that's actually like stuff that I do in my research, right? Because we talk about like in my research, I talk about like how you can create the same kind of thing using uh, we use uranium because uranium half life is really easy to calculate and it has been calculated before. So I have a little piece of uranium that sits inside that chamber, and I'm able to guide it to kind of figure out like what the deal is, and I can tell you what a second is just by listening to that and then basically calculating that tick rate. That, that is literally how like this stuff works, right? Um, and then my research is trying to put that in an IC form. So that's kind of like the whole premise of it. So whenever you hear about a clock or a sink or like anything like that, it's essentially just a way of making sure that everybody is on the same page, right? Whether it's a synthesizer or your dumb little blinky circuit or anything, they all do the exact same thing. It is all the same thing. It is all universal, right? So glad that everybody agreed upon at least that, right? So but that's essentially how that works. That is a really good question. And that question will come up again, right? So it's better that like, we talk about it now and underline the extreme importance of understanding time for these kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. No All right. Let's get back to what we were talking about. All right, magic, magic rocks, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, magic rock, clicking time thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, this is the blinky lever circuit. You blink LEDs, that's all I gotta say about that. This last one is a PWM generator based on a 5 watt timer. Um, to build this circuit, you need a 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor, which you guys don't have, but I do. So if you guys wanna build this, let me know and I can hand you one. Um, the reason it needs to be a specific capacitance for this, at least for timers, is this capacitor acts like a timing um, circuit. It helps it like flicker from like charged or discharged. That's like its signal going into the timer. So if you have like a large capacitor, because it, you know, 
cycles like very slowly, you're not going to get as like much of an effect as if you use a smaller one. So um, because you guys all have 10 microfarad and not 0 0.1, if you try building this circuit, it's not going to work. So um, just let me know if you're you want to like try for the PWM generator, um, and then I can give you those components. Uh, we're like way out of time, so I'm not going to go ahead and describe PWM. But um, in general, basically what you're going to see is this LED fading. Uh, basically, the brightness is going to be controlled by a potentiometer. Oh my goodness, I'm done. Okay, any questions? <laughs> okay, cool. Let's go to the lab. Yeah, lab time! But thank you guys. And good luck on the challenges. <laughs>